For generations, dinosaurs have captured our imagination and our hearts. Their skeletons and footprints gave us clues to how the prehistoric beasts behaved, where they lived, and how they looked. But even the most sophisticated models were just guesses until now. At the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Western Canada, an entirely new species of beast is giving scientists new insights into the life of dinosaurs and how they looked. Normally when we find dinosaur skeletons, we have parts of the skeleton. And if we're really lucky, we have most of the skeleton. But we still have to estimate what the animal looked like. We compare it to other specimens, we compare it to animals alive today, and we infer what these animals look like by putting the skin back on, putting the muscles back on. Dr. Caleb Brown is a paleontologist at the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology, home of many incredible specimens. And now, an extraordinary new discovery. A fossil so pristine and complete that it shows the texture, patterns, and colors of a prehistoric giant. The nodosaur is the best specimen we have, and it's the closest you'll come, until we find a better one, uh, in terms of coming face to face with a dinosaur. It's one of the best preserved dinosaurs in the world. The nodosaur is next to surreal. A petrified beast caught by Medusa's gaze. A fossil more spectacular than anyone had anticipated. We knew it was good, but we didn't know how good it was. I think it's the best preserved armored dinosaur in the world. I'm calling this the Rosetta Stone for armored dinosaurs. The anatomy of the new species has already given scientists clues to how these animals evolved, how they radiated and diversified through time. And it doesn't stop there. The skin is preserved. It's not just the impression of the skin. We actually have some of the original biomolecules preserved. One of the cool things that they tell us for this specimen is that the animal had at least a component of, of reddish brown pigment to its skin. The coloration aspect is very exciting, so it's, it's cool to know what color it was, or at least one aspect of its color, but it's, it's actually more exciting when that has some implications for how the animal lived. Researchers now believe the nodosaur was darker on the back and lighter on its sides and underside, a method of camouflage called countershading. Now keep in mind, this was a, a five, five and a half meter long, ten and a half animal covered in armor but it still has camouflage. And to us, that just illustrates how intense the predation was back in the Cretaceous. You had these very large, meat-eating dinosaurs, and they would have also been very visual predators. So it actually kind of just shows you how extreme that ecosystem likely was back in the Cretaceous. The immortalized nodosaur was discovered millions of years after it died, entirely by accident. Back in 2011, Sean Funk was working his regular shift at the Suncor Millennium Mine in Northern Alberta, Canada. It was around uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. It was my first day shift and uh, just digging in this material type here we call case spec that comes out in slabs like this and it was sliding down the bank after every scoop and uh, I just noticed this uh, design, like shape, that was distinctive, uniform, and it just really caught my eye. So I knew it was something out of the usual. Right away I called uh, my supervisor, Mike Grattan, and, and he came out within about 10 minutes. And then we, uh, we turned one of the lumps over and then that's when you really seen this pattern. Right away Mike was like, well, we gotta get this checked out because it was definitely nothing we'd ever seen before. Shortly after, Dr. Donald Henderson, curator of dinosaurs at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, was on the ground. He arrived certain that what he would find was a prehistoric marine reptile fossil commonly found in the area. We're looking at it and I'm thinking, this isn't working as a plesiosaur. 
because we saw ribs. And how come these bones are so nicely aligned with, with the, the, the osteoderms? And um, I, my head was still trying to make it a plesiosaur, but my technician, Darren Tankey, said, what if it's a dinosaur? And then, wow, ever, the whole picture changed. Donald was surprised because this area had been rich in plesiosaur fossils, marine animals that would have lived in the area in the early Cretaceous period, a time when Alberta used to be covered by a large inland sea. It made no sense that a terrestrial animal would have been found in this same location. A new hypothesis came to life. At some point, the dinosaur would have been washed out to sea. It would have gone through a process called bloat and float, where as the animal starts to decompose, gases build up within the body cavity and this would have actually allowed it to sit a bit higher in the in the water and that might have actually allowed it to float further out into the ocean. At some point there would have been some sort of release of, of gas from the animal and it sank to the bottom. We think it got buried very quickly and that that layer hardened very quickly, what we call concretion, this very hard rock that would have surrounded the specimen. And basically it sealed it off, separated it from bacteria and, and scavengers and stuff like that. And that's really the reason why it was so well preserved. Along with a thick armored skin, it was a perfect storm of conditions that allowed for optimum preservation of soft tissue and the animal's three-dimensional shape. The Suncor team quickly mobilized to unearth the fossil, skillfully digging over and around it. They got the, some of their best guys to come and start scraping away the rock down, and we got it isolated as a little pinnacle. And then we were all set to use um, pickaxe and an electric jackhammer the way we normally do it. But they said, why not try hydrovacuuming? Hydrovacuuming is a technique where a high pressure water jet cuts through rock while an industrial vacuum simultaneously sucks up all the rubble and debris. So they cut around it and undercut it as well because we need to detach this thing and um, expose it much more quickly than we would have normally. We knew the rock was super hard and everybody thought we could just lift it. They're working really carefully, going very slowly, lifting it up. And so we got the straps underneath it and we got their best rigging and hoisting guys to come and lift it and, and we all started to lift. Oh! Oh no. What they hadn't realized was that the center of the fossil was extremely fragile, not strong enough to bear the weight of the lift. I just get a pit in my stomach thinking about it. It was such, such a gut-wrenching thing. The solution? To go back to a more traditional model of wrapping and packing each individual piece. At the time, they still weren't quite sure what was inside the rock. Once the notosaur made its way to the Royal Tyrrell, it fell into the hands of technician Mark Mitchell. The specimen came to the museum and basically uh, everything from blocks that weighed probably about over 4,000 pounds to small chippets of bone um, and various size jackets in between. It was both very exciting and also very daunting. Uh, you look over and see these monstrous jackets are like that. It's going to take me years to do. And it did five and a half years, a total of 7,000 hours of intense and meticulous labor. Once a fossil arrives at the preparation lab at the Royal Turrell, technicians work with zip guns and heavy duty tools to get rid of the coarse layer of rock around the fossil. As they get closer, they employ smaller and finer instruments until the surface of the bone is exposed. The most difficult part was trying to get the rock to separate from the bone. Uh, the rock in that specimen was very hard and the bone was so very soft, very powdery. It's trying to maintain, keeping the surface in place uh, as I exposed it. Mark's thousands of hours of work carved his name in history. The species was christened Borealopelta Mark Mitchelli. 
Technicians put in a lot of time and effort into the job that they do. And what we do as, as paleontologists, what we do as researchers, we can't do without the technicians. They're often the, kind of the unsung heroes of paleontology. So when someone makes an extraordinary contribution, as is the case with Mark, to preparing this notosaur, I think it was a good, good uh, idea for us to honor him. That was super cool. <laughs> Just to have a dinosaur named after me, but particularly a dinosaur <laughs> as spectacular as this one. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, dream come true. And the spectacular specimen still has many secrets to unveil. The next focus of study the contents of the notosaur's stomach. In addition to having skin preserved all over most of the surface of the animal, we also have abundant uh, gut contents, so the, the last meal of the animal preserved inside. And uh, this is what that stuff looks like. So we're currently doing all sorts of work on this, uh, geochemical work, histological work, and CT scanning, trying to figure out what these spheroid structures are and there's been many ideas that part of the diversification of dinosaurs is tied to the diversification of flowering plants and it would be great to see exactly which types of plants this guy was eating and if that hypothesis makes sense. The notosaur lived towards the end of the Mesozoic era, a time when reptiles ruled the planet. Once Pangaea ripped apart, water flushed in between Africa, Europe, and North America, forming the Atlantic Ocean. The planet's land masses started to look very much the way they do now. The Earth was dominated by animals like these long-necked dinosaurs, the biggest land animals that ever lived. While the waters were home to marine giants, like the plesiosaur. About 110 million years ago, the notosaur stepped into the picture. At the time, Alberta's climate was similar to what North Carolina is like today. The land was covered by lush conifers, ferns, and cycads. The planet was going through one of the biggest changes in terrestrial landscape since life bloomed. The diversification of flowering plants. The notosaur lived much earlier than the T-Rex. But scientists believe its predators were similar, carnivorous beasts or other small pack hunting raptors. The plant eating, slow moving animal only stood a chance because of its impenetrable coat of armor. We see three rows of osteoderms. Those are what are called cervical rings, and it's armor that would have protected the neck of the animal. And as we move to the side, we see this giant periscapular spine. It's basically a big armor spine coming off the shoulder. And it's about half a meter long. By the end of the Cretaceous period, the notosaur was long gone and new species dominated land, water, and air. But they were all destined for a devastating fate. 65 million years ago, a rock the size of Denver blasted through the atmosphere, gunning for Earth. In an instant, a blinding light wiped out nearly 80% of all life on the planet. The only glimpse of the dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period we'd ever see would be immortalized in rock. The notosaur discovery can be seen as an ode to the science of paleontology. It helps to confirm things that we already knew. Often big dinosaur discoveries will kind of turn everything on its head and make us think new, new ideas about particular research. In this case, it's a bit different. We have an amazing specimen but generally it shows that what we were thinking before is pretty close. We know what dinosaurs ate, how they fought, and now what they looked like, but there's still many questions to be answered. There's so many exciting things that we would love to find. There are so many dinosaurs that are only known from very fragmentary remains. We know so little about the life history of most dinosaurs, so how they grew from 
egg to juvenile to subadult to adult. So there's so many cool discoveries that are awaiting us and I'm sure we'll find in the next few years. In Alberta, might just be the place to find them. It's estimated there are thousands of fossils hidden underneath the earth. As each of these ancient marvels is uncovered, more questions will be answered, bringing us ever closer to the real picture of the lives of these prehistoric beasts that walked the earth millions of years ago.